Migration to Europe is once again surging. EU authorities reported 133,000 irregular border crossings last year, the highest number since 2016. Most of those fleeing seek to come by sea. Two recent shipwrecks in the Mediterranean attest to the peril they face. The deaths have provoked harsh criticism of Europe's broken policy, yet some leaders want to crack down harder. The UK, for example, will pay France more than half a billion euros to stop illegal crossings of the English Channel. Yet at the same time, countries facing urban, urgent labor shortages, like Germany, want to create more legal pathways for skilled migrants. So we're asking, destination Europe, can migration be controlled? Hello and welcome to To The Point. It is a pleasure to greet our guests. Gerald Knaus is founding chairman of the European Stability Initiative, ESI. Michonen Meskena is head of the Migration and Diversity Department at Germany's Heinrich Böll Foundation. And Wendelina von Bredo is European business and finance correspondent for The Economist magazine. Mekonnen, more and more migrants are choosing that very perilous route to Europe across the central Mediterranean. Why? What's driving them? Well, we know this, this border is a deadly border, one of the deadliest uh, borders in the world, unfortunately. Uh, and still, it is the pressure which pushes people to go through this uh, hardship. Um, and the people have the information. It's not that the people don't know the hardships they have to go through uh, Sahara, through the uh, militia-controlled Libya, all this uh, violence against human rights and um, the Mediterranean Sea, the pushbacks, all this information is there. And however, the pressure people are feeling, be it uh, political, be it the war, be it economical, be it the climate, so uh, that is the pressure which pushes people into this um, dangerous situation. Let me ask you um, about a claim that has recently been made by Italy's defense minister, who says that Russia's Wagner mercenary group, which is active not only in Ukraine, but also in some African countries, is actually weaponizing migration to try to undermine and destabilize uh, the EU. Do you think that's right? Well, we have to see the whole package, Russia. No, not only the Wagner Group, but Russia is using anti-Europe sentiments, anti-colonial sentiments, and uh, anti-Western sentiments. And the Wagner Group is just one element of this anti-European, anti-West sentiments Russia is using in many African countries. Mali, uh, in Northern Africa, in um, uh, South Africa. And if we see who sided with Russia during the EU, um, the UN resolution, including Eritrea. All these countries are siding because they have some sentiment of anti-Western politics. And Russia is using this potential, including uh, immigration and uh, flight. So we have to see it within a broader mm -hmm. concept of anti-Western sentiment and also using this to weaponize um, and to destabilize probably the West. Russia, of course, has also weaponized uh, hunger, which, as you said, is one of the drivers uh, for those flows. Gerald, you and the think tank that you founded, uh, the ESI, are well known for the innovation, innovative solutions that you put forward in the aftermath of the big influx of refugees in Europe, into Europe in 2015, 2016. Is the current situation building toward the same kind of crisis we saw then? I think in many respects, it's a very different crisis. Uh, it's the biggest refugee movement in Europe since the 40s, but that's largely 80% because of legally arriving Ukrainian refugees. If we focus on those who arrive irregularly across the Mediterranean, the numbers last year, all the way from Spain to Italy, Malta, Cyprus, Greece, that reached Europe was around 160,000. Uh, that's a high number. Uh, we had uh, a lot of deaths, again, 2,000. But that is no comparison to 2015, when we had a million people just come to Greece. What is also different is that a lot of things that have been tried have clearly failed. Closing the Balkan route. Austria had more applications last year of asylum than six years ago. Uh, Italy, we have a far-right uh, 
interior minister, close to the former far-right interior minister Salvini, who talks against NGOs. But the people who arrive now don't come with NGO rescue boats. They come directly. We have a prime minister who wants to close the route. But actually, while, since she is prime minister, more people reached Italy than ever before. So the rhetoric, this kind of rhetoric doesn't work. And finally, we have in Germany, I think, a very interesting debate that the only way to have solutions, if, we, if a boat comes, and if we want to reduce people getting into boats, is a combination of offering legal ways for refugees and people who want to work, combined with agreements to take people back with safe countries to reduce the incentive to come. And I want to come to, uh, to those kinds of proposals uh, in just a moment. But, Vendelina, let, Lena, let me ask you about uh, something that Gerald just mentioned, namely the large inflow of Ukrainian refugees into Europe. Observers might wonder about these contradictory faces of European asylum and migration policy, because on the one hand, there were open arms for nearly 5 million Ukrainians who poured in in the course of last year. And on the other hand, politicians are vying to close the gates when it comes to migrants from outside Europe. Does it simply boil down to racism or what's going on here? I think that's too simplistic. I mean, it is very close. I mean, we are at the border of Poland and then the next country is Ukraine. So, so this war is happening very close to us and very close to our hearts. I mean, people have relations in, in Poland. They, they may have relations in Ukraine. You know, it's, it, these are people like us. So, it's, so, so that, that, that I think in terms of the sentiment explains it. Plus, you know, the Ukrainians are fighting in a way for Germany's freedom, for Germany's faith safety. I think that's another element. So people have been very generous all over Europe. I mean, five million is a very high number. And I think that's admirable. I mean, you know, you've, you've seen people really open their houses, give people their sofa. You know, it's, it's, it's not been easy, but, but it's been a sort of an amazing uh, manifestation of uh, hospitality and generosity. I think that's, that can only be seen in a positive light. But but there, there is a difference. So there is a difference. There's also, of course, the idea that the Ukrainians will eventually go back. That's still the hope, you know. And that's and most refugees who come here want to go back. Not only Ukrainians. That's true for many other countries. But as lo the longer they stay, the less, you know, the less likely they are to actually really return. Mikonen, how do you see it? Certainly, uh, Europe's contradictory policies do open it to charges of racism, and those charges have been made. Uh, definitely, there is some racism in, in, in that approach. On the one side, we have really to welcome the way how Europe reacted towards uh, Ukrainian refugees. That was exemplary. And this exemplary uh, approach and process should have been applied to other refugees as well. There was a great hope that we could have learned from this generosity, from this uh, very liberal approach towards uh, refugees. Um, accessing um, the labor market, accessing the housing market, etc. And I think uh, the, uh, the welcoming uh, gesture and uh, culture we have seen uh, towards Ukrainian, we have seen it in the 2015 and 2016 process as well. So there was a big gesture. But how is politics like using this potential, uh, the welcoming uh, potential towards uh, all refugees, all people seeking for protection. So I see there is a mismatch to, uh, when, when it comes to different groups. So to Ukrainians, politics was also very open. Um, but when we come to uh, people, population, I see there is a lot of potential in a, in a positive gesture towards uh, refugees and people seeking for refuge. Let's take a closer look at the situation of those refugees who are coming by via the central Mediterranean. The forced pushback of boats that were attempting the shorter Mediterranean crossing to Greece and Cyprus has in fact driven ever more migrants to attempt this very dangerous Mediterranean crossing. Uh, we just heard from McConnell, it is considered one of the most dangerous routes of migration in the world. That makes shipwrecks like the most recent ones an accident waiting to happen. An illegal crossing of migrants to Europe ended last month with a wrecked boat off the southern Italian coast. This is only one tragedy among many. 
Last year, according to the UNHCR, some 2,000 people died fleeing to Europe. They mostly arrive on overcrowded boats from Asia or Africa, and their numbers are increasing. This year, about 20,000 migrants have already been registered in Italy alone, almost two-thirds more than in the previous two years. But many countries in Europe can't or won't take in any more refugees. In addition, Italy recently passed a law that severely restricts the activity of rescue ships in the Mediterranean Sea. The only thing that has been said, repeatedly, is that they should not be fleeing. This is first and foremost an ethical message. Don't leave your homes. Possibilities to, to, to change your, your, your actual life, probably uh, you, will, you will take the decision to, to go to the sea. I'm sorry, this is the reality. Can Europe stem the growing influx of refugees? Gerald, I'll put that question straight to you. Yes, but only with public support. And the paradox is that the public, and we've seen it also in the United Kingdom, reacts very negatively to small numbers that cross by boats from France, while being very generous to take in people through resettlement. Also the United Kingdom, people have said, we volunteer to have Ukrainians in our house. We've seen that in Australia, a migrant country uh, created by mass migration, very, very united around stopping small boats with very small numbers. So the, the, the paradox is that people are afraid of small numbers because of irregular arrivals, because they suggest a sense of loss of control. But there is empathy on which one can build if one organizes it. So those small boats are clearly very symbolic, especially for right-wing politicians like the one we just heard in that report. You've referred to the political aftermath of the 2015 refugee crisis as a success story, but there is one factor that is quite different now, isn't it? Namely, the rise of right-wing sentiment in a number of European countries. How much does that change the prospects for for pragmatic solutions? I mean, there have always been far-right proposals. In 2015, presented by Viktor Orban, and in 2018, presented by the Italian then Interior Minister. But the trouble today is not that the far-right is in power in more countries. It is that the centrist parties have run out of ideas and are now doing or condoning policies at the borders, which were, in Germany, only presented by the AfD, the far-right German party in 2015, but which are now implemented at the EU's external border and Germany is, even Germany is not openly criticizing it. So the real threat we, we have here, is, it goes far beyond refugee issues. It goes to the rule of law. Europe has laws, conventions, human rights, uh, commitments that we are breaking systematically at our borders. And this is supported by governments of all political backgrounds. And that is the crisis because that undermines the very basis on which Europe is built. Let's pick up on that point and link it up to uh, ethical and moral obligations. McConnell, you have long said that Europe has an absolute moral obligation to rescue those who are in peril on the sea. Yet Italy's government uh, has come under sharp criticism for restricting humanitarian organizations' ability to do so. And in that report, we heard an Italian politician saying, no, the ethical obligation is on the migrants themselves to stay at home. This is very cynical, to be very honest. Of course, um, countries of origin have the obligation to do everything to give people a better perspective in their home countries. So I see really there is a great responsibility and obligation on the countries of origin, not on migrants. Migrants are just reacting to what is happening in those countries. Um, human rights, violence, war, uh, climate change, which we are also responsible for the climate change. So there is a lot of responsibility on, on, uh, on the international community, but not really in the, in, on the individuals. The other thing is, what is obligation when it comes to supporting uh, refugees and also people who are looking for protection? Uh, every country has an obligation, including the European Union. So people flee at first place to the neighboring countries. That way they stay for a certain period of time. 
looking for a perspective to go back. That is the, the first option, be it in uh, uh, Syrians in Jordan or in Lebanon or in, the, in the Turkey or Eritreans going to Sudan and to uh, Ethiopia, etc. Once the perspectives diminish, people go to the next step and it, then take all the risks, you know, like the risks of uh, Sahara, the danger of the Mediterranean Sea and so on. And that's why Europe comes uh, into, into the game. So either we stop, you know, the uh, destabilizing, uh, the destabilizing situation is in those home countries. So we do not react, but we act from the beginning. That is also part of the responsibility, not only taking refugees, but also to really tackle the issues people are forcing to leave their homes. So there is a broader range of responsibilities. Vendelina, that's long been a mantra, including of German development policies. We, you know, we have to reach out and try to fix uh, those uh, long-term push factors, as, as they're often called. But that's a long-term. That's, that's a long-term matter. And what we're seeing here is short-term pressure, short-term desperation. I mean, as a long-term project, I think it's still good, of course, and it's, a, it's, it's the right way of thinking about it. But, but we are dealing with a short-term crisis and we need solutions now. And what governments are doing at the moment, including the recent agreement between uh, Britain and France, and I think I will talk about that later, is just exactly the wrong way to go about it. Very interesting, that's exactly what I want to talk about right now. The government of Great Britain is among those that are vying to be seen as tough on migration with some help from its friends across the English Channel. This handshake seals harder times for migrants. France and Britain have struck a deal to stop migrants from crossing the Channel illegally. The UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has promised his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron more than half a billion euros. We're announcing a new detention centre in northern France, a new command centre bringing our enforcement teams together in one place for the first time, and an extra 500 new officers patrolling French beaches. 45,000 migrants crossed the English Channel to reach Great Britain last year, an increase of nearly 60% over the previous year. They arrive in inflatable boats despite the British government's harsh warnings that those who come here illegally cannot stay. Under the new asylum law, the migrants face detention as well as deportation to Rwanda or other countries. So far, that has not been implemented due to legal hurdles. Critics fear that the right to apply for asylum is being curtailed. Will the UK's tough asylum policy become a model for the EU? What do you think, uh, Gerald? How would you assess this deal? Vendelina has told us it is not the solution. What do you say? No, no it is a complete bluff. Uh, and uh, what is striking, actually, is that last year more people left France with boats to the United Kingdom than left Africa to go to Spain or left Turkey to go to Greece. I mean, this is one of the biggest irregular movements. And one of the reasons is that there has not been a single return of anyone who reaches the United Kingdom from France uh, since the United Kingdom left uh, the EU and left uh, the, the, the Dublin system, which never worked well. The so Dublin system being the overall European yes, Union system France for should take some distributing back. refugees. Exactly. So what we have is that anybody who gets into a boat and reaches the United Kingdom, and they are all discovered. They don't come in secretly, but that's not a problem. Anybody who reaches the United Kingdom stays there. And that means that the idea that more French police uh, that just stops boats uh, will be the solution is, is a farce, because people can try five, six, seven times, and France can't lock them up legally. What we need to do, and I don't understand why two democracies are not able of finding the solution, is that France or the European Union, or France can do it unilaterally, offer to the United Kingdom. We take back everybody from this date, 1st of April, who crosses and reaches the UK quickly, because France is safe. You don't need to leave France. Mm -hmm. In return, the United Kingdom should agree to give a chance for legal access for 40,000 people a year, less than crossed last year, that are in the European Union already, that can apply and that can then leave without risking their life and without smugglers. So the United Kingdom shows solidarity. It takes still less refugees than Germany or France, but it takes refugees orderly. 
But France and the UK combined to take away the incentive to get into a boat and pay smugglers thousands of euros. And that solution is the only one that can produce a result uh, in, the, in, the, in the next few months, because what the UK is planning with Rwanda will not work for a very long time, perhaps in a year, they will start to have the first plane. What they try to do the Fr with the French to give them 500, billion, million, 500 million euros for three years to then keep people back. That's very much like what Europe has tried to do with Morocco and it didn't work very well. It certainly looks like outsourcing the problem, uh, Mikonen. Uh, tell us whether you think a solution like, like what we just heard from Gerald would in fact be a better approach. And then I'd also like to talk a little bit about the deportation and return issue, because in fact, the European Commission just reported that last year, only 21% of those who were not granted asylum in the EU were actually returned to their countries of origin. Would more be deportation, which is what the EU commissioner is calling for, would that actually begin to solve this problem in some way? Well, in any way, uh, all, all moves towards outsourcing never worked. You know, we, we have all these examples of Berlusconi uh, cooperating with Gaddafi. There are so many examples which didn't work at all. Uh, so outsourcing problems wouldn't work at all because people would always try again and again to reach their final destination. So be it Italy uh, outsourcing the problems uh, to Libya or UK to France or uh, Denmark and UK and Israel to Rwanda, whatever, whatever you do, if people are not granted perspectives to stay around their home country with a better opportunity to go back to their really origin country with better perspectives, nothing would work. They will always seek for opportunities. Most of those people who had been deported, for example, from Israel to Rwanda, they emigrated to the US and to, the, to Europe again. So even if you have a better dealing conditions between UK and Denmark and whoever it is with Rwanda, even if it is a really good coordinated, people would not stay there because there is no better perspectives for them in those situations and countries. So I think we have to look into the situation from the perspective of the refugees and immigrants. And then just really to also apply other instruments like resettlement, where they have a more acceptance between uh, among the population because they see these are those people who are in need of protection. So we need new approaches with old instruments. The instruments are not new at all, but we need just new approaches. Vendelina, I'd like to very briefly pick mm -hmm. up on something that Gerald said as we talk about uh, solutions. He said the real problem is not the rise of the far right. The problem is that even liberal democracies are beginning to, um, to doubt, uh, to lose faith in the system as a whole. Do you think that uh, a country like Germany, uh, which in fact has been a bulwark of liberalism uh, in many ways, do you see it going the path, for example, of Sweden, where we are seeing a real crackdown now? Um, I don't think you can exclude it. You know, I, I, I hope the center will hold. And the big mistake, for instance, a country like Austria did is they tried to then copy the sort of centrist parties or the, in particular, the centre-right parties tried to copy the policies of the far right, thinking they will, you know, win over some voters that would normally go to the far right. That's the wrong, that's definitely something to be avoided. Germany has so far resisted that temptation. But I don't think you can completely exclude, you know, it's, it's, there's so much happening, there's so many crises at so many fronts, you know, the cost of living crisis, the war, you know, the, the, everything that, that I think we have to be always vigilant in terms of protecting our liberal democracy here. So I don't think you can say, no, no, Germany's safe. I don't... Carol, Germany does seem to be moving toward a certain shift, uh, but the question is, uh, is what are its broader implications? Two German ministers recently made uh, a trip to Africa to try to court skilled labor because of the labor shortages in this country. But would that really help to reduce illegal immigration? Are these two very different challenges? But what is really interesting is that in the German coalition agreement of this government from end of 2021 and with the appointment of a special envoy to implement migration partnerships, Germany commits, this government, all three parties commit to say, 
We want to make offers to countries. If they take back their citizens who have to leave from, uh, with a focus on those who have committed crimes quickly, we will offer legal ways into the labor market. And that's in fact the key. We've had many uh, migration agreements that worked, but they've only worked if there have been interests on both sides. Um, and the problem is, if we don't find good migration agreements that work on the basis of human rights and, human, uh, and, and, and the refugee convention, we'll get Australian style agreements, which worked. Nobody's coming there, but with a horrendous cost in human rights. Mikonen, very briefly, good agreements that are in line with human rights and European values. Uh, how optimistic are you? Well, this, this may work. I, I think we have to break a lot of taboos. You know, we, we have also to think the issue of immigration and uh, asylum politics, you know, in, in a context of granting people the perspectives. That's really a very key issue because people are coming to look for better opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much to all three of you for being with us. Thanks to our audience.